just as Gauguin mythologized himself, he mythologized places to fit his own ends. In 1882, he began to remake his life, leaving the stock market to devote himself to painting. Two and a half years later, he left his wife and family. Unable to afford life in Paris, he moved to pont a -Vin in Brittany in 1886. pont a -Vin's natural beauty, the light filtering through the canopy in the Forest of Love, appealed to painters. Fifteen hours by train and wagon from Paris, pont a -Vin lay in the department of Finisterre, from the Latin, for the end of the earth. To 19th century Parisians, it seemed an apt description. Cut off from Paris, Brittany was also cut off from modernity. Its largely agrarian population lived off the land and the sea, farming, fishing, and harvesting kelp for the manufacture of iodine. Celtic rather than Gallic by origin, the Bretons were devoutly religious, keeping to the old traditions. By the time Gauguin arrived, pont a -Vin was becoming a mecca for tourists in search of the quaint. But it was a starting point for Gauguin's quest for authenticity. He lodged at the Glowenec Inn, a cheap and popular spot for many painters drawn to the area. His earliest Breton paintings owed much to Impressionism, but he gradually stepped away from portraying life as he saw it. Gauguin eliminated any signs of modernity and depicted his subjects with intense, vivid blocks of color. My reputation as an artist is growing day by day, but meanwhile I sometimes go three days without eating, which undermines not only my health but my energy. This I intend to restore, and I am off to Panama to live like a savage. Still looking for paradise, Gauguin arrived in Panama in 1887 with Charles Laval, a younger artist. Work had begun on the canal, which would open the floodgates to another wave of colonial adventure. Gauguin found work with a construction firm. After two weeks and bouts of malaria and dysentery, the painters made off for Martinique and found a new storehouse of ideas. We have found a native hut on a plantation. Below us, the sea and a sandy beach for bathing. And on either side, coconut palms or other fruit trees for a landscape painter to feast on. What appeals to me most is the people. And every day brings a ceaseless coming and going of island women in colorful, faded finery with their infinite variety of graceful movements. Gauguin returned to Paris late in 1887 and sold some of his Martinique paintings. The perceptive critic Octave Mirbeau was spellbound. There is an almost religious mystery, a sacred, Eden-like abundance in these forest interiors with their monstrous vegetation and flowers and their tremendous sunsets. Gauguin returned to Brittany in 1888. Two years earlier, he had left as an observer. He returned as a prophet. I love Brittany. Here I find wild and primitive features. When my wooden clogs resound on this granite ground, I hear the muffled and powerful thud that I seek in my painting. Finding pont a -Vin too touristy, he took lodgings in Le Poudou, a fishing village on the Atlantic Ocean. The Hotel Buvette de la Plage was home to painters of a new generation looking for a new path. Gauguin urged artists not to copy nature too much and express instead images and ideas forged in the mind. In his painting of Jacob wrestling the angel, the bold red background ignores the natural world and replaces it with color that creates a dreamscape. He titled it, The Vision of the Sermon. In a letter to Vincent van Gogh, he described the painting. Breton women praying, 
very intense black clothes, yellow-white bonnets, very luminous. The ground is pure vermilion. I think I have achieved great simplicity in the figures, very rustic, very superstitious. For me, in this painting, the landscape and the fight exist only in the imagination of the people praying after the sermon, which is why there is a contrast between the people, who are natural, and the struggle going on in the landscape, which is non-natural and out of proportion. The painting made him a father figure to the younger artists. Gauguin playfully caricatured himself as Lucifer, the fallen angel. Halo intact, framed by the apples of temptation and grasping the serpent. Gauguin has cast himself as both saint and sinner. It was painted on a cupboard door in the dining room in the inn at Le Poudou, which now displays replicas of his works. On the other side, he painted a portrait of his friend Meyer de Haan, a Dutch artist and protege he met in Brittany. Gauguin turned Meyer de Haan into a devilish creature given to reading philosophical books that dealt with the relationship of man to God, like John Milton's Paradise Lost, another reference to the theme of the fallen angel. For all his tongue-in-cheek playfulness, a deep current of spirituality runs through Gauguin's work. Raised a Catholic, he rejected the institution of the church, but not the faith, nor its imagery. A sculpture of Christ being taken down from the cross outside the church of Nizon inspired Green Christ. He moved the setting to the cliffs and dunes above Le Poudou. He was drawn to Brittany's humble, direct forms of worship. The chapel at Tremolo near Pont Avin captures the essence of the region's homespun Christianity. One painter described Brittany as a primitive world where paganism lurked behind a veneer of Christianity. Gauguin transported the crucifix to a Breton landscape. In Yellow Christ, he employed a fiery, unnatural palette and outlined the figure to emphasize its flatness, deliberately making it more primitive. The setting echoed a local Breton belief that saw a mystical connection between the crucifixion and the autumn harvest. Yellow Christ, reversed, serves as the background for one of his most telling self-portraits. Completed in 1889, Gauguin paints himself as flanked by, or perhaps torn between, the Passion of Christ and the image of a ceramic savage. <laughs> 